Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. It's Bob Vonderheide. I'm the director of the Abramson Cancer Center here at Penn Medicine. We are having a super exciting summer here at the Abramson Cancer Center. And we're so happy that you've joined us for our annual Breakthrough Challenge um, research update. This is Breakthrough Challenge 2023. And we're um, going to be talking about breakthroughs in action. Um, we uh, are so pleased that so many of you have, have joined us. We, we, um, what we'll do is we'll hear from four faculty who will, um, who've received funding from the Breakthrough Challenge and we'll talk about their research um, across three different presentations. We'll talk about three different uh, clinical scenarios and I'll introduce them one by one. Um, and we'll have opportunities for um, everyone to ask them questions after we hear from everybody. So we're looking forward to a great hour. Uh, settle back, enjoy lunch, uh, enjoy uh, listening to us if you're sitting on the beach or at some other fantastic uh, vacation uh, spot. We hope everyone is having, having a great summer. Before we dive in, I just wanted to say a, a few, few words and give a little context about um, what's happening. Um, so um, as, as you all know, uh, um, we've had tremendous growth and tremendous progress at the Abramson Cancer Center over the last five, 10 years. And we thank all of you for your support in so many ways. And um, there's no higher priority that we have than taking uh, high quality care of individuals diagnosed with, with cancer. Um, we're, we recognize cancer remains an awful problem and far too many Americans succumb to, to the disease every year. What we also know is that we're making progress, not in every tumor type, but in many ways. And um, we, our, our contribution from the Abramson Cancer Center has been to make major discoveries and to understand cancer biologically and to bring those therapies as rapidly as possible to patients in the form of new clinical trials that once they're successful, we drive the FDA approval so those drugs are available, not just here in Philadelphia, but throughout, throughout the world. As many of you know, since 2017, there have been 21 such FDA approvals in oncology based on work led or co-led by investigators here at Abramson Cancer Center. Today, we're gonna go back in time and maybe hear about some of the work that will eventually lead to new FDA approvals, and so that's why we're, we're super excited. We combine a very large research mission with a very large care mission. Uh, we estimate that within the Philadelphia area, for everyone diagnosed annually with cancer, we take care of, primary care of, um, more than a third of those patients. So we have a huge responsibility. And many, you know, an additional, um, you know, uh, several thousand patients come to us from across uh, the rest of the country and across the world for care. Um, and we have a very large research effort, both laboratory, but also clinical trials. And you'll hear about the, the interaction there. Just as an example, you know, we enroll something like 13,000 subjects every year on to clinical trials. Um, one of our um, major priorities is um, developing and, and bringing on new faculty and enhancing their careers so that the discoveries they make today and tomorrow will turn into um, therapies uh, the day after that. And that really is what the Breakthrough Challenge uh, initiative has been all about. Um, the, now in its 10th year, uh, the Breakthrough Challenge has raised more than $2.25 million. 100% of the participant raised funds uh, go directly to supporting research here at the Abramson Cancer Center. And we can't thank um, the leaders of Breakthrough Challenge for entrusting the Abramson Cancer Center with that very important mission um, to provide countless opportunities uh, for our faculty, but also for our patients and their families um, to um, participate in the fun of the Breakthrough Challenge, but also to support our work. So, so far, the Breakthrough Challenge has supported 49 investigators, most of whom are junior investigators or in the beginnings of their career, we call them Buzz Cooper Scholars. Buzz Cooper was Cancer Center Director a few years before me, who was uh, devoted to the careers of, and, and confidence that young scientists would make the difference. 
And today you'll hear from uh, a few of those, as I, as I mentioned. Um, most important today, uh, get out your iPhones and your calendars and mark Sunday, September 10th. Sunday, September 10th will be the 10th anniversary celebration for the in-person bike ride at the Daniel Boone uh, Homestead, uh, where it's been uh, traditionally. Uh, I have to say it's an incredible amount of fun. We almost always get the most fantastic weather. I'm sure it'll be the same way this year. But in addition uh, to um, the, the, the ride on that day, there's other activities. And of course, there's the week-long virtual event where there's um, an opportunity to participate as a spinner, a runner, a walker, and a cyclist. And all that starts September 4th. So it's not just a single day activity, it's a whole week. And, um, and we really encourage uh, everyone, everyone to, um, to participate. Okay, so um, with uh, that, um, let's uh, move into um, uh, science. And as I said, we have three presentations by four faculty and, and, and I'll just tell you who they are. We're going to hear from Steve Bagley uh, related to brain tumors, and we'll come back to Steve, and I'll introduce him in a minute. Um, Dario Babashak, who's going to uh, talk to us about uh, bone marrow failure syndromes as precursors to leukemia and what we can do about that. And then a joint presentation by David Feltzer and Chen Cheng Jin, who uh, will talk about a really interesting connection about the use of antibiotics, uh, personalized um, tailoring of antibiotics for patients with lung cancer um, 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 and really exploring the role like the microbiome has in, in cancer. Okay, so going back to it, so we'll do those in order and then we'll take your questions and we're gonna have a lot of fun. Um, you know how to ans ask your questions. It's in the Q&A in, uh, in the chat. Some of you have already put in the questions and so we'll get to as many as we can. Okay, so our first speaker is Steve Bagley. Uh, he's a physician, physician scientist, is, uh, he's an assistant professor in the Division of Hematology Oncology in the Department of Medicine here at Penn. His, he focuses his clinical care on patients with glioblastoma. There he is. Hi, Steve. How are you? Lots of diplomas there in the office. Very impressive. You can maybe have the opportunity to tell us how pretty much every single one of those diplomas has come from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, which is the fun fact about you. Uh, Dr. Bagley works with Dr. Induka Amankalar, who's the director of the Brain Tumor Center here at Penn. Can't be with us today, but Steve's going to uh, um, uh, present the work they're doing uh, together. So uh, you're going to be talking about unmasking opportunities to treat patients with brain cancer by activating the immune system using a um, using a vitamin um, uh, a derivative, retinoic acid. So, Steve. Okay, thank you so much, Bob. I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay, uh, so so thanks so much for the opportunity to present today uh, and to the Breakthrough Challenge for the generous funding to be able to conduct this important work. Um, I am going to talk today about unmasking brain cancer to the immune system using, as Bob mentioned, a vitamin A metabolite called all trans retinoic acid or ATRA. Uh, and before I jump into this, I just want to reiterate um, that Naduka Amankalor, uh, who is a very close um, collaborator of mine, is really responsible for a lot of the basic science that led to these discoveries. And, and he was unable to make it today, but really this is a, a partnership and a, a joint presentation. So I want to give him all the credit for, for the background science here. So a, a quick word on this disease. IDH mutant glioma is actually the most prevalent brain cancer in adults. And this is often a surprise to people because, you know, we hear a lot about glioblastoma, which is a, a different type of aggressive brain cancer. And glioblastoma actually has a, a higher incidence, so that there's a higher rate of, of new diagnosis of a tumor like that each year in the United States. But the reason that the prevalence is so much higher for IDH mutant glioma is that this is a disease that tends to affect young adults and they tend to live for a significantly longer period of time than somebody with a typical diagnosis of glioblastoma. And so because of that, there are a very large number of individuals uh, in the United States every single year who are living their lives with IDH mutant glioma. And <clears throat> what is, I think, really uh, devastating about this disease is that it's affecting young adults in the prime of life. 
Um, so the, the typical age of diagnosis here is between the 20s to 40s. And although the survival time ranges between five to 15 years, which is substantially better than what we see with a disease like glioblastoma, when you're 25 years old and, and told that there may be 10 years of life expectancy, you can imagine the, the incredible toll that that takes um, personally and, and professionally and all the other ways that these young people are affected. So this is um, kind of a bridge to uh, what I'm going to talk about, which is that we are looking for better ways to treat this disease to one day make it a curable entity. And the basic discovery that now that we look back, seems so simple, but, but was really quite elegantly um, detected by Dr. Amoncolor, is that retinoic acid, uh, which is again a vitamin A metabolite, actually plays a critical role in being able to unmask or unveil these IDH mutant brain tumors to the immune system. And so what I'm showing here is, is what I, I will refer to as the usual state of these tumors. So this is how they behave naturally if you don't intervene and do anything which is that these cancer cells are, are incredibly depleted of retinoic acid, which again is a vitamin A metabolite that carries out normal functions in all of the cells of our body. And for, for reasons that until very recently were not understood, these IDH mutant cancer cells simply don't have enough. And when they don't have enough retinoic acid, it actually results in a number of changes that make T cells, which are shown in the purple there, really the warrior cells of the immune system, completely unable to recognize the tumor as something that shouldn't be there. And they're essentially helpless to be able to, to eradicate it. So this tumor will just trot along slowly for years, undetected by the immune system. So what happens is if you replace this retinoic acid in the form of a pill, all transretinoic acid or ATRA, you get to what I'll call the goal state, where the retinoic acid is replenished inside these cancer cells. And what we find in the lab is that all of a sudden, now they are unmasked to the immune system. The T cells are actually able to encounter the, the tumor cells and begin to carry out the functions necessary to, to kill those cells. And sure enough, when you do this in mice, we, we see pretty incredible responses. So the top bar there shows you a mouse brain with the tumor circled in yellow dots. And when you treat that mouse with retinoic acid pills, you can see on the right, the tumor completely goes away, which was pretty incredible to see. And with standard treatment below, which is a chemotherapy pill, these tumors actually don't respond very well in the lab and, and they grow out, as you can see in the yellow here. And unfortunately, that's what we ultimately see happen in, in patients as well with chemotherapy. So <clears throat> I'm summarizing many years of Dr. Moncler's science on one simple slide here, but Ultimately, this led to a clinical trial that we are currently conducting at the Abramson Cancer Center. Um, and so this is a, a, the first time really anywhere in the world that we're studying ATRA in patients with recurrent IDH mutant glioma. And I just want to tell you a little bit about this clinical trial because we are, we are really excited about it. Um, group one of this clinical trial is for, for a group of patients that we're, we're calling the primary group. These are individuals with an IDH mutant glioma that has recurred after having already had the standard treatments. And those patients will simply receive the atropils and, and then we monitor their MRIs over time to see how it's working. But there is also a separate group here called group two. And we refer to this as the window of opportunity group. And the reason we call them that is because these are individuals who also have a recurrence of their tumor, but they have a clinical indication for surgery. So these patients, for whatever reason, need to have their tumor removed surgically. And so because we know they need that surgery, we take this as a window of opportunity to actually give them the Atra pills for one to two weeks prior to the removal of the tumor. And then once they're recovered from surgery, they, they resume the pills. And what this does is allows us to actually take that tumor that has now been exposed to Atra and understand in this human specimen what those atropils actually did to the tumor, what they did to the immune system, and we get a much richer understanding so that however this trial goes, we're able to build upon it and further improve and refine the regimen for the future. So I wanna close by showing you what happened with our very first patient who we happened to enroll in this study. Um, we've treated eight to date, 
the very first one um, is actually experiencing stabilization of their tumor that was growing prior to enrollment on this trial and, and are actually experiencing um, significant clinical benefit. And so this is um, an individual showing the MRIs here, and I'll walk you through this. This is a 38-year-old man uh, with a recurrent IDH mutant tumor who had already had all of the standard treatments and actually had already been on several clinical trials as well, and none of them were working. Um, this MRI here from June 2022, um, if you follow it right there where the red circle is, you can see that this faint tumor right here in the center. And when we met this individual in October of 2022, you can see the tumor was clearly growing compared to where it was in June. And so this was somebody we thought really needed to get on this trial. We went ahead and started them on the trial. There's the ATRA start time. And what was really interesting was on their first MRI, a couple months later, you can clearly see the tumor is larger. And this worried us, of course. Um, and so we, we asked the patient how they were doing. He was doing just fine, felt great. And we know that this is a phenomenon you can sometimes see with brain tumors where they actually look a little bit larger from immunotherapies like this before they start to get better. And so we decided we will keep you on trial and watch things very closely. Sure enough, we've been getting serial MRIs ever since then, and this tumor actually completely stabilized and stopped growing. And on the most recent MRI back just a month ago, what we're seeing is not just stable size of the tumor, but if you look hard here, you can actually appreciate some breakdown in the center, little areas of black, what is called necrosis or, or cell death in the center. So we actually think this is a tumor that is um, responding to treatment, and eventually we expect to see tumor shrinkage. This individual uh, remains on the study now for eight months, working full time and is an active father of two children. And so um, we are really encouraged by these results and, and look forward to seeing what we get with the remainder of the patients on the study. So I will stop there and I again, thank everyone for their attention and, and for the breakthrough challenge for funding this work. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And um, some questions are coming in. We'll get to uh, uh, that after a couple of presentations. Can I just ask you, before we move on, um, as you and first of all, congrats um, not only for this trial, but also just for you and Dr. Nduka and the whole team really generating a lot of hope and a lot of excitement, new ideas for patients with all types of brain tumors. It's um, it's been a real challenge, so perfect for breakthrough challenge to figure this out. How if it's successful, how would you incorporate Atra into taking care of patients with glioma? Yeah, it's a great question. So one of the, the biggest challenges in this population is that because they are young, healthy adults in general, uh, the standard of care right now is that after they get their surgery, we actually offer them radiation therapy. And radiating the brain in somebody who is in their 20s um, has significant um, negative long-term ramification. And so there is a trend in our field right now for these tumors to try to offer non-radiation therapies up front as actually part of the initial treatment of the disease. And so this is a kind of a really cool scenario, which is that if this works in our clinical trial, we're going to have the opportunity to study it in newly diagnosed patients right off the bat. And, and ultimately, my long-range goal would be that we are treating newly diagnosed young adults with this disease without brain radiation yeah. and, and really moving towards immunotherapy. Yeah, fantastic. You make everything sound pretty straightforward, but what's the biggest challenge? So I think I sh actually showed uh, what, what may be the biggest challenge, which is these tumors will get bigger before they get better. Um, yeah. and, and we see this even with standard treatments in brain tumors, and it has to do with the blood-brain barrier, which gets broken down by treatments, and, and things look larger even when they're actually benefiting. And so one of the biggest issues here is understanding how long we can keep somebody on a clinical trial in the face of a of what looks like a larger tumor. You can understand the challenges that presents to patients and, and we have to have patients ourselves to to wait it out if somebody's doing well. Yeah. Yeah, I know you're we don't have time to get into it today, but you're working on other types of biomarkers besides just an MRI to help us uh, uh, you know make those incredibly um, um, th those those tough decisions when we're treating patients on trials and regular therapy. Okay, so so hang on, we're going to come back to you after we hear from a few more faculty. Don't go anywhere. Thank you. Um, uh, we'll introduce uh, our next faculty, who is 
Daria Babushak. Let's see if we can bring Dasha on. Um, Dr. Babushak is assistant professor in hematology oncology in the Department of Medicine. Uh, she's in, there you are, MD. You probably have diplomas in the background, I just can't see them. Um, uh, you are an MD, PhD, physician scientist uh, based in the laboratory, of course, take care of patients as well. And you're gonna tell us about um, this phenomenon of bone marrow failure, how the immune system interacts with that and what it can teach us about uh, intercepting cancer. So thanks so much. Very good. Thank you so much. Let me see, can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can see yes. and hear you. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, so thank you so much for this introduction and I'm very excited to share um, to share a little bit of progress on this project, um, testing a novel therapy for autoimmune bone marrow failure. And we're very grateful for the support from the Breakthrough Challenge. Um, so I would like to first uh, begin by introducing this group of disorders called bone marrow failure syndromes. And of this group, perhaps the classical example is something called aplastic anemia. So these are Conditions, if you think of a bone marrow, um, which is a factory where our blood cells are made, and there are certain conditions that essentially make it very difficult for the blood cells and the stem cells to survive and grow. And under this constant pressure and struggle, um, these diseased bone marrow cells develop new genetic changes that can later progress to cancer. And so essentially, it's a group of precancerous conditions where, which can be uh, caused by a number of reasons, um, which later develop new genetic changes. And as one of their unifying principles is that many of them are closely associated with development of blood cancer, such as acute myeloid leukemia or myelodysplastic syndrome. In aplastic anemia in particular, it's an autoimmune disease where essentially patients are previously healthy individuals. So they can be children, they can be adults, can be even elderly who all their life had normal blood counts. And one day they may notice that they're very tired or they have bruising and this rash that looks like maybe they're bleeding a little bit or bleeding from their gums. And they may have fevers or infection and they get to their primary care doctor, they check their blood counts, the blood counts are low across the board, not just the anemia, but also low white blood cells or low platelets, which are our clotting cells. And if you look in the bone marrow of these patients, as you can see here on the left-hand side of the slide, you see here the pink and purple, which is in the normal bone marrow, our stem cells and blood progenitors. And then in a plastic marrow, it's essentially empty. And so this is a very dangerous situation. So of these types of severe cases, we have up to about close to a thousand, it's estimated in the United States of new diagnoses per year, but we are probably under-diagnosing some of these milder cases that may run um, undiagnosed because patients are not that sick. When patients present with the severe cases, it's very life-threatening. Essentially, patients may need intensive care such as uh, blood transfusions, for example, multiple times a week, hospital admissions, they need to be treated. Treatment is difficult very costly, and as I will talk about on the next slide, what we are still doing in the field is frequently very old-fashioned therapy, so things that were cutting edge maybe 60 years ago. So, for example, very um, broad immunosuppressive therapy that can be very toxic or even bone marrow transplant. And so in the last 60 years for this disease, only one new drug has been developed in FDA approved. So in this cartoon, I am showing a typical patient course who's treat of, of a patient with aplastic anemia where the, um, the patient is diagnosed in this critical state when they need a lot of care. They then are treated that, for example, this broad immunosuppressive therapy and altrombopag, they achieve a transient response. They may no longer need transfusions, but the response is frequently partial. And for example, what we see is that about a third of patients may not respond, a third of patients then of those who responded relapse, sort of falling off the bike here and then clawing their way up. And then it goes on and on. And essentially, um, even though the patient may be in a partial remission, 
there's still this pressure in the bone marrow to accumulate some of these genetic changes. And this is what leads to the predisposition to cancer. But there's hope. And the hope comes from a growing understanding of what actually causes this autoimmune attack. And can we now use this knowledge to develop rationally designed therapies? And so in this model, you can see the current understanding of the development of aplastic anemia, where we see this cytotoxic T lymphocytes in orange here, which are the drogue cell that somehow becomes apparently activated. And now it is seeing the stem cell in the bone marrow of the patient. And when it sees the stem cell, that's something that it shouldn't, it's its own stem cell, it should not respond to it abnormally, it then decides to destroy it. And so this distraction then leads to the empty bone marrow. And we now understand that one of the key players, sort of this glue and this engine and the fuel that fuels this fire of the autoimmune attack are these inflammatory cytokines. So these are the bad actors, these are substances and proteins that are secreted by the lymphocytes, and they help the, the lymphocytes to grow, they help them to kill the stem cell, and they also suppress the bone marrow. And this really is, is at the heart of our project and this, this idea. So we know that many of these cytokines signal through a group of proteins called the JAK proteins. And so our study tries to incorporate the use of these JAK inhibitors. So it's a class of drugs that is approved for many other cancers and also is importantly, is, um, these are effective in a number of autoimmune disorders. So we are trying to see if we can use these JAK inhibitors to now apply them and treat them to a plastic, treat, treat patients with aplastic anemia. And the idea here would be that we treat aplastic anemia sooner, better, in a safer way, and this may also change the natural history. If we treat it better, perhaps the bone marrow is not exposed to these ongoing cycles of selection and destruction where we see a lot of the new genetic changes come up. And perhaps we may see the, then lower frequency of cancer, and so we can essentially intercept the development of cancer in this group of patients. So, and the reason why we think these JAK inhibitors would work is that if you, um, they target inflammatory cytokines that you can see here on this graph, we can see this brown staining, it's in the bone marrow of the patients. This is the activation, apparent activation of these cytokines. There's also two other key lines of evidence. There was a previously one case of a patient who was treated off label with one JAK inhibitor, and we can see that in this patient, we saw low blood counts. The patient is treated where this arrow is, and then we can see that they had a remarkable recovery. Additionally, in the National Institutes of Health, they have previously tried in a bone marrow failure mouse model to add a non-selective inhibitor to the mice, and the mice survived. You would ask then, why isn't this used in patients yet? Well, there is a good reason. And this group of JAK uh, proteins is very important for signaling of inflammatory cytokines, these bad actors in the immune attack, but it's also critical for some of the blood growth factors. And in fact, patients with such low blood counts have never been treated previously with JAK inhibitors. So we think, however, that this presents as an opportunity. We now know a lot more about the, this family of proteins, and we have a number of different JAK inhibitors that we can choose so that we can target specific JAK proteins to improve safety as well as efficacy. And so this is my last slide, which essentially just shows the framework for what we are currently doing. We have a model in which we can um, induce aplastic anemia in mice by infusing special uh, lymphocytes that target a specific protein on their uh, stem cells in the bone marrow. And you can see, just like in human patients, this great expansion of this apparently reactive lymphocytes. And this then coincides with a reduction in the amount of stem cells in the mouse bone marrow. At this point, we are then treating patients with a selection of uh, specific JAK inhibitors, some of which target different types of um, JAK proteins in order to improve the safety as well as preserve the efficacy, and at the same time seeing how we can combine it with our standard therapy. Um, so this is all I have. Uh, thanks, Tasha. I'm coming back online. Here I am. Um, before we move on, let me just ask you, you know, like, like, um, what's the next step? Let's say you, you finish this up, it's successful, 
um, how do we uh, get patients uh, treated? How do we use this to intercept? Uh, yes. So we um, so we are really poised actually to take this further into early stage clinical trials. So at the moment we are trying to select which drug would be optimal. I fully expect that these would be effective. The safety is, I think, the biggest question. But how do you use it safely in this group of patients? But we, what we would do is essentially start an early phase clinical trial, potentially as soon as maybe a year from now, where we can yeah. give this to patients early. And by giving it early, we would yes. be able to hopefully um, prevent having to use more toxic treatments. Give it early before the counts go down. With before the, the count, treatment. well, right. before the counts really plummet. So um, okay, so we're gonna um, we're gonna put a uh, point in the calendar to come back and ask you how it's going in a, in a year. And so, uh, but don't go away. We're going to have a Q and A. There's some questions coming in for you. Well, let's hear from our last two faculty, who are David Felter and Chen Cheng Jin. Uh, we should see them come in a minute. There's David, and and we're going to get you some diplomas to hang back there behind you. And. Um, so a quick word about David and Cheng Cheng. David is associate professor in the Department of Cancer Biology. He's a cancer cell biology expert, a PhD, and has been at Penn um, um, for a while. And Chen Cheng Jin is also in the same department. I, are you guys just down the hall from each other maybe? That's and right. uh, collaborating. And um, Chen Cheng is assistant professor of cancer biology, also PhD. I should mention David runs the graduate group for cancer biology here at Penn and is so obviously a, a leader in educating our graduate students and uh, getting them on their way. So you're gonna talk about antibiotic therapy and lung cancer. We're pretty interested to hear about that connection. So take it away. All right, thanks, thanks Dr. Vonahai for that introduction. Um, I'm really uh, excited to present some of the work that uh, myself and Dr. Chen Chen Jen have done over the last year with uh, money that we've uh, received from the Breakthrough Challenge. Doubly in, uh, excited to be presenting to this audience because many of the names in this uh, participant list that I see here, I also see in my Strava feed because I follow uh, a lot of these a lot of these people who did the cycling event uh, with us last year. So it's really fun to see uh, some of those. Um, the work that I'm going to be telling you about is again a collaboration between myself and Dr. Jin. And it's really based on a technology platform that I've developed in my laboratory and a breakthrough discovery um, that uh, has been developed in Dr. Jin's laboratory, working on antibiotic therapy and how that may impact um, certain patients with a specific uh, combination of genetic abnormalities and lung cancer. So as we, as we know, um, each lung cancer patient has a distinct set of cancer genes. And so um, we study lung adenocarcinoma. So what I'm showing here is a pie chart of uh, individuals with lung adenocarcinoma. And across the pie chart here are different genes that are mutated. And these genes are special because they're called oncogenes. These genes are mutated and they uh, allow the cancer to form and they're required for the continual maintenance of tumors. So um, the ones that I've circled here particularly important because we have medicines that can target these particular oncogenes and reverse their effects. And because these cancers are addicted, so, uh, so to speak, to the actions of these oncogenes, these medicines that block their effects will lead to the death of these cancer cells. And, then, and each one of these medicines has profound uh, effects on patients that happen to have uh, these, these mutations. However, it's important to understand that an individual's lung cancer has between zero and one of these particular oncogenes. You may not have any of these that are clinically actionable uh, in a precision sort of way, and, you, and yet you will never have a combination of these. So on the other side um, of oncogenes, there's the collection of uh, a genes called tumor suppressor genes. And these genes are uh, different than oncogenes because their natural forms keep cancers from forming. And so in cancer cells, these genes are actually inactivated and absent from the cancer cells. So conceptually, it's very difficult to figure out how one might or design a drug that targets a protein uh, 
uh, that's encoded by one of these genes because it's absent in cells. So, you know, the unfortunate situation is that if we target these oncogenic lesions, um, relapse will occur uh, in, in many of our patients. And uh, the relapse um, is independent now of, of whatever uh, oncogene was targeted. So the idea is to be able to target both oncogene mutations and tumor suppressor gene mutations uh, within a single individual um, to lead to more durable therapy. So in my lab, we use mouse models uh, to study uh, lung cancer uh, initiation and progression. And we've developed a powerful platform to activate a specific oncogene in the mouse, as well as use gene editing technology to produce uh, specific mutations in a collection of tumor suppressor genes. And we can do this in a, a so-called pooled sort of way so that each of these uh, gene editing, these are viral-like particles now, they use this CRISPR technology to remove specific tumor suppressor genes throughout the, the mouse's lung, uh, lung uh, cells. In the end, what happens is you get these mice develop multiple tumors. One has a different collection of genetic abnormalities, either has an oncogene mutation, which we hear, or one of these tumor suppressor mutations that we also engineer. So the power of this system is that we can use these mice now to screen large uh, genetic combinations by binning them into these groups where they obviously receive uh, traditional therapies that are um, that might be uh, emerging or existing, or they can use combination therapies, again, that are emerging or existing. And the goal is to identify which of these uh, combinations are particularly susceptible to uh, whatever therapy we're trying to, trying to discover. So cartooned here, this combination therapy is particularly effective at, at targeting this orange tumor here, which I say has, um, which is a, an important tumor suppressor. So based on this technological platform, I've teamed up with Dr. Jin, who has a laboratory just down the hall from, from mine, and she has uh, developed a breakthrough discovery uh, in the world of the microbiome. And I'm going to turn it over to her now to um, tell you about that. All right. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity, and uh, thanks, Dr. Felder, for the kind introduction about the background of our collaborating project. Um, so basically, um, our uh, findings was based on this uh, microbiota. So probably, as you know, that there are hundred trillions of bacteria um, that are colonizing the human body, and they are very enriched in these mucosal surfaces. And these commensal bacteria are collectively known as uh, microbiota. The primary habitat of these commensal bacteria are along the gastrointestinal tract but the bacteria are also present in a lot of other mucosal surfaces, including the respiratory tract and the lung. And recent studies have shown that these commensal bacteria play a major role in regulating cancer progression, and, um, and it also can regulate uh, the cancer response to various uh, therapies. So for example, it has been shown that the gut microbiome play a major role in regulating the effect of immunotherapy. And what's really interesting and relevant for our study is that um, several studies have shown that uh, microbiota is actually a key component of the tumor microenvironment, including the tumor microenvironment of lung cancer. So our previous work have demonstrated that lung cancer is uh, associated with an uh, increased uh, bacterial burden, as well as an uh, increased uh, number of bacterial species. So basically, in patients with lung cancer, we saw a dramatically change in these local bacterial communities. So um, based on this, and in collaboration with Dr. Felder's group, we created a series of mouse models that can develop lung adenocarcinomas that bear um, the different types of most common tumor suppressor genes uh, in their uh, lung cancer. And these, um, uh, as Dr. Felder mentioned, these are common mutations you would actually find uh, in lung cancer patients, uh, including P53, LKB1, uh, RB, TIP1, and study two. And uh, we treated these uh, tumor-bearing mice uh, with antibiotic cocktail that consisting of broad-spectrum antibiotics. 
And importantly, we found that antibiotics treatment can potently inhibit the growth of lung tumors lacking uh, the gene P53 or LKB1, resulting a very robust reduction uh, in the tumor burden. But interestingly, tumors with other types of mutations, such as RB, TB1, or CD2, did not respond to this antibiotics treatment. So um, I think this result really uh, help us to identify the genetic vulner uh, vulnerability in response to antibiotic uh, treatment, and uh, suggesting that the different genetic makeup of tumors in individual cancer patients uh, can determine their sensitivity uh, to antibiotics treatment. And furthermore, uh, we found that depleting the bacteria with antibiotics not only benefit the lung cancer patients as a single uh, therapeutic agent, but it also um, has a synergistic effect when we combine the antibiotics treatment with other therapies, such as a immuno checkpoint blockade. Uh, specifically, using the mouse models, you can see that the mice uh, with P53 mutant uh, lung tumors, uh, they actually do not respond to anti-PD-1 single treatment. This is re really recapitulating uh, the large proportion of lung cancer patients who uh, do not benefit uh, from the anti-PD-1 single treatment clinically. But quite remarkably, you can see here that we found the depletion of the tumor associated by, uh, the tumor-associated bacteria by treating the mice with aerosolized antibiotics can dramatically improve the effect of anti-PD-1 therapy. And hopefully what you can appreciate from these representative histology pictures is that um, these densely um, like uh, stained regions are uh, like the tumor lesions. And what you can see is that the combination of antibiotics and anti-PD-1 treatment can lead to a marked decrease in lung tumor burden. So moving forward, we hope to conduct the clinical trials uh, in lung cancer patients who do not benefit from current uh, checkpoint therapy. And we are hopeful um, that by combining aerosolized antibiotics with the current uh, checkpoint uh, antibody, uh, we could uh, achieve maximal uh, tumor control. So with this, I want to thank uh, like Dr. Felder for kindly collaborating with us. I want to thank Dr. Vanderheid for giving us the opportunity, and I we're really grateful for the generous funding support from the Cancer Center. Okay, thanks. Um, we can take your slides. So I just had a, I wanted to ask the two of you a question, and then we'll go straight to to the the scientific question. How? Okay. How did you guys start to collaborate? Okay, you're down the hall. David was here for a while. Cheng Cheng, you can't, you were recruited. Just give give the folks a little glimpse of like, what what did you have a cup of coffee together? Like what what was the, the how did it happen? Uh, uh, I guess it happened over many conversations. Um, you know, um, I. I played a large role in bringing uh, Chen Chen or trying to convince her to come to Penn in the first place. Yeah. Uh, and uh, her research really was, um, you know, groundbreaking. And I just knew that um, the stuff, the technologies that we were building could really, could really help um, maybe guide us in a new direction. Um, and so when the opportunity came to uh, get seed money to, to try to see whether there's some synergy here, then, you know, I literally walked down the hall and I said, hey, we can do this. And um, uh, yeah. uh, we are, um, you know, there's many, many stories of that serendipity and the positive uh, culture of collaboration that we have in the incredible physical plant. Literally, I've walked down the hall myself to uh, get collaborations. There's something special about how we're, uh, how we're set up. Um, so a question that's come in for, for this team, and then I'll ask everybody else. It has to do with, um, you know, um, it, it, the connection to um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which our patients often have, you know, they, you know, sort of an emphysema type. And is 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 there a connection there? Um, um, like the mice don't have 
COPD. So, but there's a lot of microbiomes that are, we, we often treat COPD with antibiotics. So is there a connection there? I guess I can jump in here. Um, so uh, there's definitely have uh, studies have shown that COPD patients have uh, uh, altered uh, microbiome uh, locally mm -hmm. in the lung, and uh, when the condition got really severe, they would get um, uh, antibiotics treatment to uh, to treat the infection. So uh, we've compared actually the bacteria associated with lung cancer and bacteria associated with COPD, and we certainly see a lot of similarities. And I think what's really happening is that when the tumor grows large enough, uh, when it's obstructing the airway, uh, this can actually like uh, create a favorable micro environment for the bacteria to overgrow. And uh, so that's why like the bacteria grow out in such conditions there are certain similarities. Um, so we would certainly think that by applying antibiotics that can target those bacteria uh, in both COPD and lung cancer would have clinical benefit uh, for, for those lung cancer yeah. patients. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of our viewers, uh, James, is asking about that, and I, I believe that's um, what was on his mind. So that's, that's really interesting. Um, maybe we'll ask Steve. Steve Bagley, are you there? You have a couple of questions. Um, I am here. Okay. Yeah. So. So Atra is used. Um, we already use it in cancer, and has it and has it, you know, but for a certain specialized type of leukemia. So, do you think you could ever combine it with chemotherapy? Uh, and do you think there is a role for Atra in glioblastoma as opposed to glioma, which you told us about today? So two two questions for you. Right. So to also answer the second one first, which is that uh, this seems to be. Um, a benefit that is specific to IDH mutant uh, cancer cells. And so there is some reason to believe that there may be um, an effect here in other cancers of the body with IDH mutations, um, which could include certain um, gallbladder cancer, um, you know, other types um, of diseases. But in glioblastoma, which by definition does not have an IDH mutation in, in any case, um, we really don't see application of ATRA there. Um, but with regard to combinations, I think it's a great question, and, and uh, I think it's ripe for combinations with not just chemotherapy, but other immunotherapy drugs. Um, there are actually IDH inhibitor pills now that are on the market um, and could be combined with Atra too. So if this proves effective, I think the sky's the limit for combination studies. One other question before I leave you is, um... It's a special population of patients who have glioma. They're younger. And one question was, are, what, are the, what are the other demographics? Um, uh, gender, race, ethnicity, is there, is there a particular uh, demographic that is unique? It, it actually tends to be uh, the, the, the incidence is higher in Western um, industrialized nations, uh, which is interesting and perhaps suggests something environmental um, that we don't know of yet. Um, but in terms of um, racial, ethnic backgrounds, it is more common in Caucasian patients for some reason. Um, but nonetheless, as, as I wrote in my, my message, I, I think enrollment of other racial and ethnic groups is critical because we, if this works, we ultimately want it to be extended to all patient populations. And I think there are real differences in terms of um, you know, how these diseases affect different groups and it's important we include everyone. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dasha, question for you. Um, in, our, in, in our going back and forth, we use this term interception of cancer, which is, well, just what is your view of that? And, you know, we just started, a, a, the Basser Center here just started an interception uh, center. Can you tell, a little bit, tell us a little bit more about what interception is meant to be? Well, it's such a great concept. So, and I will use bone marrow failure as, a, as an example um, of a perfect area where we can um, intercept cancer. So, essentially, if you have, for example, a condition that is a precursor. So, for instance, why do blood cancers develop in some patients? So, we don't fully know, but we know that a subset of them emerges precisely out of conditions that may not have been cancerous to start with. So it's an autoimmune disease. And yet, by continuing to act on the bone marrow in aplastic anemia, it really blurs the line. Where does the 
autoimmunity end and at which point does the cancer begin? Can we here intervene? Can we essentially stop the cancer in its tracks by changing the natural history? Can you treat it early and completely enough to prevent some of these really driver mutations from occurring? So that is the way I, I see it. No, and I think um, there's many, many examples of interception. We're going to use. Um, okay, question for Chen Chang and David. Are, okay, so people are fascinated by this notion that bacteria is, is actually in cancer and maybe driving cancer. Um, is there any specific bacteria that you know that uh, particularly encourage lung cancers to grow? Does that help you figure out which antibiotic to use? Um, what's the spe what's the specificity here? Uh, right, um, and that's a great question. So this is exactly what we are trying to identify now. Uh, from our current data, we have some evidence to suggest that uh, anaerobic bacteria, which sh uh, usually should not be living in the lung, are enriched uh, in lung cancer um, patients. So hopefully, uh, we could uh, move forward with our research and. Uh, basically treating patients with antibiotics that specifically target anaerobic bacteria locally could be a way to really help the, the lung cancer patients. David, did you want to jump in? No, you're good. Yeah. Um, were JAK inhibitors used in COVID patients with extremely high cytokines? Would that data be helpful to you, Dasha? Have you? Well, we have a whole team at Penn working on that. We have a whole team right from the cytokine uh, from the cytokine center, storm center. But yes, indeed. So jack inhibitors have been used um, to treat certainly this hyperactivation of cytokines and COVID, but also in several other immune conditions, including cancer. So, for example, myelofibrosis or these these also blood cancers that are interestingly also associated with overproduction and signaling through the same pathway. Um, so it's helpful in a sense as to confirm that yes, it should work. Yes, these really are likely to be very effective. Just the challenge is how do you balance it with suppressing the blood system? But it really is true that um, we have several types of selective JAK inhibitors where I think we will be able to use it without suppressing the blood count recovery. And so once we do that, I think it will be incredible to have a new oral option that now has already come through. You know, certainly there are some drugs that are approved where we can readily incorporate it very quickly into clinical trial and really transform how we treat these patients. Um, it's very exciting. One last question, and then I'm going to ask uh, uh, Josh Wolfson. Josh, are you there? We'll, we'll get your comments from the Breakthrough Challenge Board. But one final question for David, and I've, I've gone to the, the another tab here where there's some additional questions. Mouse model, is it is it hybridized and made human? Can, can that, is that also a way to, to do that, or is this all mouse? Um, what's, the, what's the latest, the newest tech, up and coming technology for modeling cancers in mice, your expertise? Yeah, so the mouse model is uh, entirely mouse, um, but it could be human, uh, humanized in some fashion. And we could we could focus instead on human cancer transplants using humanized immune systems in mice and things like that. And that might be a interesting way to go. At least an, uh, an alternative way to kind of validate some of the findings. One of these, one of the powerful things about modeling in mice that you brought to Penn and your work prior was. We, we've identified, we know the oncogenes and tumor suppressors in humans, and then we engineered those into mice. And the big discovery was mice now get human type of cancer. And it really, as your data just showed, really opened us a whole new possibility that makes the data so relevant. The human cancer, even the mouse is still a mouse. So Josh, um, let me welcome you, um, hopefully, and thank you to our faculty. I'm, there's a lot of, uh, lot of uh, applause in the chat about um, these great presentations. Um, Bill, Barber, particularly, I thank you for your comments. And Josh, uh, um, from the Breakthrough Challenge Board, um, welcome. Josh. Yes, Wilson. thanks, Bob. And, and on behalf of the Breakthrough Challenges Board, I just wanna thank everyone for attending. I know everybody's got a busy schedule, uh, either on vacation or, or with work, and we appreciate you taking time to hear about all this important research. 
uh, Bob, I want to thank you for all your support for the ride and your continuing guidance to us in identifying the promising research that we've been able to uh, to fund over the years. Uh, I want to thank all of our presenters. Uh, we know it takes a lot of time to put together these presentations and drill down into about 15 minutes what, what you're working on, and we don't take that for granted. We appreciate you taking the time to do that. I want to thank our sponsors who's for the upcoming ride in 2023, whose names you see on the slide in front of you is the Zent Family Foundation, Krieger Architects, Henley Aronschick, Siegel, Pudlin & Schiller, Trek, and Steve Harvey Law. Their support really makes the Breakthrough Challenges efforts possible. Uh, as Bob said at the outset, uh, this will be the 10th year of the ride. We've raised almost $2.5 million to fund projects like these early stage research projects. Uh, we have a goal of identifying those early stage projects with the hope that we're going to leverage the funds that we raise into a lot more and have a multiplicative effect by putting people in a position to essentially turn on the spigot of bigger funding sources with this early research that they do uh, with identifying these promising avenues of treatment. Uh, without the early stage funding that we provide, I, I think some of these projects might never happen. And we're really excited that we've been able to be a part of these projects and these success stories. Uh, as Bob said at the outset, our ride this year is September 10th at Dan Boone Homestead. There's a virtual option for runners and walkers and spinners and bikers if you can't be there in person. Um, I, I would encourage everyone to join in for the ride. Uh, if you're not a rider yourself, but you know someone who is, please tell them about us, encourage them to ride, encourage them to join. It's uh, uh, breakthroughchallenge.org. We'll bring you there. Uh, aside from being a great cause, and it is a great cause, uh, it's a beautiful ride through the countryside and it's a really fun day. So uh, I just, again, wanna thank everybody. It's, it's the work you do and the hope that you offer that gives us all the motivation to continue to stage the ride. Uh, so thanks everybody for being here today and, and I hope we'll see you all in September. Yeah, we'll be there, Josh. Thanks so much. Shout out to um, uh, Chuck Zent and the Zent family with the matching program. Shout out to uh, Bo Ebby, our chair, and, and Josh as the vice chair. We'll end it there. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, we'll see you September 10th, and we'll see you virtually September 4th. Give us a shout. If you have any questions on how to get involved, uh, let us know. We'll, we'll get you that information. Um, see you next time. Thanks, everybody.